Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I came across yesterday from Cambridge in the United Kingdom, uh, where we're doing a lot of work on sustainability leadership. And this is especially a pleasure because uh, this year I've been filming a documentary on the circular economy called Closing the Loop. And um, Novamont is going to be one of about 10 cases globally that we will be featuring in this documentary film, which I'm producing together with an Emmy award-winning director. And that will be out uh, in the first half of next year. I want to talk to you a little bit uh, this morning about the link between economic performance and environmental performance and how this has become a competitiveness agenda. I like to start by just being clear on the problem that we face. Uh, this rather complicated chart is the summary of the dilemma that we face as a world. On the vertical axis, we have the ci stanno le traduzioni con le cuffie perché vedo che c'è gente che arriva se qualcuno vuole avere la traduzione è disponibile in simultanea okay. on the vertical axis we have the environmental footprint of the countries of the world and in 1961 all of these countries represented by different colored dots were living within the capacity of the earth um, by 2006 that capacity had halved because we had population growth and increased consumption. So now far fewer countries are living within the capacity of the environment. And in fact, if everybody in the world was to live at the same level that we live in Europe, then we would need three planets. If we all lived the same lifestyle as the Americans, we would need six planets. And if we lived at the same level as the uh, uh, Arab Emirates, we would need six planets. So we have a real problem here. On the other hand, if we look at the horizontal axis, we have the United Nations Human Development Index. This is a measure of health, wealth, and education. And all those countries to the right of this vertical red line are countries with high human development. And you can immediately see the problem. Where we want to be as a world is in this box. This is the sustainable development box where we have high human development and we're living within the capacity of the earth. And there's not a single country that is within that sustainable development box. We've managed to work out how to take countries out of poverty to high human development, but we haven't been able to do it without increasing their environmental impact. How do we move developing countries across to high human development without increasing their environmental impacts? And how do we move countries like Italy and other countries in Europe and the West down in their environmental impacts without us giving up our quality of life? That is the challenge that we face. How are we doing on environmental performance? Unfortunately, this is extremely bad news. According to the, uh, the Living Planet Index, since 1970, we've lost more than half of the species population on the planet. And if you look at that graph below and you look at the trend, then in the next 40 years, your children or grandchildren will have no life left on this planet. And that means that our ecosystems will collapse. They will fail to support our life on this earth. So we really do face a crisis, a sixth mass extinction in the history of the planet. And this is not only an environmental problem, this is an economic problem. If we look at the cost that we're imposing on the environment, that the companies, the industry is not paying at the moment, we can see that the numbers are quite big. If we look at the utilities industry, uh, that's around about 420 billion. If we look at basic materials, over 300 billion dollars, and so on. These are all costs that sooner or later, companies, industry will need to take on, will be forced to pay. And if you're a company like Novamont and you go ahead 
of that trend, then you're going to be the more competitive company in the future. Of course, we have a massive stimulus coming now since we adopted the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals last year. These goals will last us till 2030, and they will result in a lot of investment going into the areas of society and the environment. In fact, the amount of financing is estimated is needed in developing countries to meet these goals is $2.5 trillion. This is about 3% of global, uh, the global economy or 1.1% of global capital markets. What we're seeing in the capital markets is massive collections of investors who are prepared to only invest in more sustainable industries and sustainable uh, e economies. Uh, one collection that I've just given as an example here is a group called We Mean Business, and together they represent just 550 companies and investors, but 7.8 trillion in revenue, or 20 uh, trillion in assets under management. So you can see that these are big numbers of capital that is being put in to environmentally responsible business. And we can expect this trend to increase. In fact, Italy itself has pledged uh, $334 million to the Green Climate Fund. And we will see more and more of these kinds of investments. There is an interesting link uh, that we found between being more responsible as an economy and being more competitive as an economy. There was a study done uh, on something called the Responsible Competitiveness Index, and it consists of 21 measures across three areas, policy drivers of uh, responsibility, uh, business actions, including codes and standards for sustainability and ethics, and social enablers. This is to do with civil society action on community development and sustainable development. And the most interesting thing is that when you track the uh, responsible competitiveness index against the economic competitiveness index, you find that there is a very strong relationship. What this means is that economies that are more responsible, more ethical, more sustainable, are also the economies that are more economically competitive. And this is a very strong message to uh, economies like Italy that is prepared to invest in more sustainable industry. In fact, what we know from other research that's been done is that there is a huge market for more environmentally responsible products and services. There's a global index, a survey done by Philips, which asked customers whether they felt that environmental benefits were important in the products and services that they are consuming. And what you see from this chart is that not just in Europe, but also in countries like China, Saudi Arabia, and the United States, environmental issues are becoming more and more important. But most interestingly, when they ask those same customers, are they currently getting those benefits from the products and services on the market, very few of them felt that that need was being fulfilled. And certainly if you're in the game of marketing, you'll understand that this represents a gap in the customer needs, and wherever there's a gap, it means there's a market and there's money to be made. Another study that was done looked at the Responsible Competitiveness Index and compared it to the European Innovation Scoreboard. And once again, you can see that there's a strong relationship. So industries, countries that are more responsible, more sustainable, not only are more economically competitive, but tend to be the economies that are more innovative. We know, of course, that the growth in markets in clean technologies is huge. Uh, in fact, it's one of the strongest growing markets in the world. There are estimates that markets for clean tech um, will grow to 2050 and, and uh, grow rapidly. And in fact, what might surprise people is where the most growth is happening. And you might assume perhaps that it's, it's Europe, but 
uh, there is more growth happening in Africa in clean technology. So when we're developing these solutions as Novamont is doing, we need to be sure that we're not only focusing on Europe as the consumer market for this, but also looking globally at where this might uh, be, be, be coming from. Uh, in fact, when we look at markets like circular economy, uh, the latest estimate we have that globally by 2030, this represents a market of $4.5 trillion. Now this is a, an approach and a policy that uh, the European Union is supporting quite strongly. Uh, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the Lisbon Agenda, which is the competitiveness strategy for Europe, and that it is based on three fundamental pillars. And that is to be smart, inclusive, and sustainable. So if you're an industry that is positioning yourself as inclusive with the community and sustainable, you're very much aligned with the EU's policy. And one of the concepts that they're using that aligns so beautifully with Novamont's model is the concept of eco-innovation. And they define eco-innovation as the development and application of new business strategies that entail a combination of improved products, production processes, organization, and business models that lead to significant improvement in sustainability performance. And what's absolutely clear is that this new plant of, of Novamont is exactly in this area of eco-innovation. Now, what is the business case? Is there a strong financial reward for companies that will invest in eco-innovation? The European Union did a pilot project where they invested in just 100 eco-innovation initiatives. And th they were quite small, so each initiative was only employing eight people. And look at the returns that they got from these 100 projects in eco-innovation. Even though it was creating just 800 jobs collectively, uh, those projects saved 609,000 tons of waste. That's the equivalent of a city of 125,000 people. It saved 170 million cubic meters of water. It saved 4 million tons of material. That's the same as for building 200 Eiffel Towers. It saved 11.6 million tons of carbon dioxide. That's the same as the energy that's used to power 1.7 million homes. And overall, 1.6 billion euros in environmental and economic benefits. In fact, for every one euro that there was invested in these projects, they got 20 euros back. This is the power of eco-innovation. This is the business case. We know this also from recent studies done by the World Bank that start to look at the returns in the marketplace of companies that are investing in reducing their carbon intensity or their carbon footprint. And what this graph quite simply shows is that those that have shown the most improvement on their carbon performance are also the companies that are showing the most improvement in the marketplace. Similarly, those companies that are investing the most in uh, tackling climate change are also outperforming the market, both in terms of their environmental performance and their financial performance. Of course, big companies, especially in the chemicals industry, are waking up to the opportunities in this area. I've just taken this one example. This is by uh, BASF. And this is what they call a stakeholder materiality matrix. What it means is this is what they hear when they ask their stakeholders what is important to them. And just to highlight some of the issues that customers, communities, government, and other stakeholders are saying is important to the chemicals industry now, right at the top there, those that are most important and could have the most impact on this chemicals company are energy consumption and efficiency, resource security, sustainable production, water pollution, waste, product stewardship, life cycle thinking in the value chain, pollution opportunities, and agricultural practices. 
Once again, these are areas where you can see Novamont is very well positioned to bring solutions to help address these concerns of our stakeholders. Of course, it's not all easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. There are barriers to the adoption of sustainable uh, technologies and the expansion of the bioeconomy. Uh, not everybody gets it right, like this cartoon of Stone Age Man says, I call my invention the wheel, but so far I've been unable to attract any venture capital. Not everybody gets it right, and there are significant barriers to overcome. Um, some, some work that's been done by the OECD uh, suggests that there is uncertain demand and uncertain return of investment. And that's why sometimes the investors are hesitant to put their money into sustainable technologies. Access to subsidies and finance is often not as supportive as it could be. In other words, the government isn't playing enough of a role to help these technologies to go to scale. Investors themselves lack the experience to understand whether this really represents a long-term financial opportunity. Often there isn't enough priority given in the countries in which these markets exist to the importance of improving the energy matrix for that country. Uh, there's a lack of authority coordination within government, governments operating in silos where the one department is contradicting what the other department is saying. There's a perception that environmental technologies always mean higher cost technologies and always mean that you have to pay a premium and that needs to change. And there is, of course, technological lock-in. So interesting that we're in this venue today, a very old technology, and for every wave of technology, society gets locked in. And it's very difficult to move to a completely new technology because we've invested so much in the status quo. But there are also enablers that will allow us to break through to these new technologies. Once we start getting accurate pricing on energy and materials, once we start to internalize the externalities, ensure that industry and companies are paying the real costs for resources, that they're paying the real costs for the damage that industry is doing to the environment, then we start to change the game. And this may come in the form of prices on, uh, on pollution, it may come in the form of carbon taxes, all of these things are happening globally. Of course, it really helps if you get government policies right, especially if there are incentives such as subsidies that help companies <coughs> that are going ahead of the curve. It helps as well if technology has the skills development surrounding it so that we have the capacity to bring these new technologies to market. It helps if customers are more aware. We've got the situation now in France, as I'm sure you're aware, where they're banning single-use plastic bags in shopping. And so customers are starting to get aware that these are issues. In the United Kingdom, uh, just putting a five cent or a five P cost or price on plastic bags in shopping uh, in, in, in the stores has reduced the number of plastic bags by 85%. So customers are becoming more aware. Investors in financial uh, markets also need educating so that they know that this is really the wave of the future where most of the money will be made. And of course we need the technological innovation which is precisely what we're seeing with this wonderful new plant of Novamont's. So I'd like to end with this quote from uh, David King, who's uh, a director at Oxford University uh, and also uh, on the World Economic Forum Technologies Committee. He says, uh, human ingenuity is the answer. We created the science and engineering technological revolution on which all our well-being is based. The same keen intelligence can point to the solutions to the hangover challenges. And this requires nothing less than another renaissance. And I'm so delighted to be part of this renaissance, and especially I congratulate Novamont for being at the forefront of the renaissance towards a circular economy, a bioeconomy, and a sustainable world. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.